So I'll be talking about 3D characterization of acetabular morphology and how we've been applying it in San Diego to perform patient-specific correction. So uh, we've been using plain AP uh, radiographs for more than 100 years using the lateral center edge angle and the tonus angle to define uh, the acetabulum on this one-dimensional image. Uh, Moritz and the Byrne group have done this excellent study published in CORE in 2015 to bring our attention to the anterior wall, posterior wall and start making these measurements that are shown in the upper right corner to start understanding the three-dimensional shape of the acetabulum, even though we're just looking at a one-dimensional image. So there's some limitations to that radiographic assessment. You know, we have little data on control or asymptomatic patients. The image quality is really dependent on patient position and technique, and there's variations in adolescence with growth. We work at the Children's Hospital in San Diego, so a lot of our patients are skeletally immature, and so there's a lot of changes that happen before maturity that aren't captured by some of these values. So we wanted to talk about this 3D characterization of the acetabular morphology. And these are the steps that we use. So first, after obtaining the CT scan, we standardize the position using uh, the landmark shown on the top right. We then determine the acetabulum center using a mathematical best fit sphere represented by the green dot and then define the edge of the acetabulum as well as the fossa. So the acetabulum and the weight-bearing lunate surface is shown in blue and the fossa is shown in red. And then use a custom MATLAB script to measure coverage angles. So this is just a sample patient measuring coverage angles in a 17-year-old female. The pelvis is shown in the lower corner. So if you create an axis connecting the green dots on both sides and then rotate the pelvis 360 degrees, it gives us a continuous measure of the lunate surface area, the blue, as well as the fossa. So you can see the chart on the top is kind of giving us these continuous measures. So starting superiorly, working our way posterior, inferior, anterior, and then back up to the superior. <clears throat> so this is the coverage for this one particular patient. If we take that continuous data and break it into octants on the acetabulum, so this is her same data. The blue, again, represents the weight-bearing surface. The red is the fossa. And then if we take a cohort of these 17-year-old females, you can get this um, uh, standard deviation errors in the eight octants uh, for a group of 17-year-old females. So just for clarity, I'm going to focus on the five uh, octants that are within the box. So the sore seal <clears throat> would represent the superior, superior anterior, and superior posterior sectors. We have our anterior wall and posterior wall. So if you want to kind of correlate this to the lateral center edge angle of Weiberg, you can see that 120 degree average measure on the superior quadrant correlates to the 30 degrees Weiberg. So 120 minus 90. So we published the initial data on our control cohort, which was 157 patients with 314 hips. These patients all had pelvic CT scans performed by the general surgeons for diagnoses such as appendicitis, and we went through their charts to ensure that they didn't have any hip pathology. Their ages ranged from 8 to 17, and we found some significant differences in those measures with age and with sex. So basically, females had more acetabular aniversion, females had more acetabular tilt, and males had a greater acetabular surface area. And you can see how that data increases between the age groups from 8 to 10, 10 to 13, and 13 to 17. So the next step, which is going to be presented at the Academy meeting uh, this coming March, we looked at our group of DDH patients that had the CT analysis pre-op. So we had 74 hips. So now we can age and sex match each of our patients to their appropriate controls, and we developed the Z-score, which is basically the difference between the subject's measures minus the control divided by the standard deviation. And based on some previously published criteria, minus 2 to 2 is considered that normal Z-score. So out of those patients with DDH, we basically found four types of deficiency that these patients could have. Global deficiency, if they were significantly deficient in all the quadrants. So now just to clarify, these graphs, that light gray is the normal population with the standard deviation, and the dark gray bar is for this particular patient. So we had global deficiency, anterior deficiency, posterior deficiency, and then superior, basically purely lateral deficiency. And the incidence of those are shown on the left. 
So if you compare this to the z-score, now again, minus two to two is considered normal. So lower than minus two is when these patients are significantly deficient, and those are the quadrants that we would have to address with our surgery. So the globally deficient group, you can see in all five quadrants, anterior primarily in the three anterior quadrants, again, posterior and superior. So here's some case examples where we can um, use this technology. So this is a 16-year-old female worsening left hip pain. This is what her radiograph looks like. We actually started treating her at 11 months of age back in 2000, where she was presented with a dislocated hip. She was treated with a pavlic harness, abduction brace, which failed, underwent the Ludloff open reduction, and then followed radiographically. You can see the residual dysplasia. She was lost to follow up for a number of years and then presented again at 16 years with the pain. So based on the radiographs, you could see the dysplasia and the slightly large head coxa magna, possibly due to a mild uh, AVN after the open reduction. The MRI shows the CAM lesion on the radial sequences as well as the labral pathology. And we get the CT scan to define the 3D morphology of the acetabulum. So again, the standard radiographic measurements are there on the left with the lateral center edge of 13, tonus angle of 17. And the CT analysis shows that she is uh, Z-score less than minus two, primarily superiorly, superior posterior and posterior. So unlike the standard dysplasias that you see with DDH that are anteriorly deficient, she was more deficient posteriorly, and you can get a good appreciation for that from the pre-op crossover sign. So uh, back in September, she had a hip scope with a uh, PAO surgery. Arthroscopically, we addressed her labrum as well as the cam lesion. This is her PAO. <clears throat> and so we got a post-op scan on her to look at uh, the extent of the osteochondroplasty as well as the correction we get with the PAO. So now the dark black bars represent her PAO measure, or the, her post-op measures, and you can see that she's within that minus two to two range, specifically corrected in that superior, superior, posterior, posterior sectors of the acetabulum. Here's her pre-op and post-op. After she's healed, the screws were removed, and here's her, again, pre-op hip, post-op hip, and the changes in the Z-score, as well as the CT analysis shown uh, with the sector analysis. Here's another patient, so 13-year-old with iatrogenic FAI, right-sided hip pain. This is what her x-ray looks like. So she was treated at five months, of old, uh, five months of age for a subluxated, dislocated hip on the right with a pavlic harness. She was non-compliant with abduction bracing, had residual dysplasia at three. She underwent a Pemberton osteotomy at six. And seven years post-op, you can see significant retroversion or overcorrection of that acetabulum with impingement and pain. So her pre-op CT scan shows that she's primarily deficient in the uh, superior anterior region uh, with a Z-score of plus 4.2 and plus 3.9. So she underwent a reverse PAO back in August, and you can see her post-CT measures, again, the black bars, showing that those regions have been corrected to within the normal range. So here's our pre-op post-op after the osteotomy is healed. And again, you can see the changes in the sector analysis. So real quick, other applications of a 22-year-old female with right hip pain, you can see the crossover sign. She's overcovered. Uh, the standard measures of the lateral center edge and tonus, which you can see. The coverage analysis shows that she's overcovered primarily superior, superior posterior, superior anterior. And this analysis also lets us break up the weight-bearing zone as well as the fossa to see if we could perform either a rim trim to just correct the overcoverage laterally or if we should do a reverse PAO because she is, you know, has decreased surface area. So it helps you in that decision-making process as well. And finally, a 24-year-old female uh, that had a PAO performed at an outside hospital with significant retroversion, too much coverage anteriorly and laterally. This is confirmed on the coverage angles with Z-scores in the four uh, in the superior anterior quadrant. You can see her joint space narrowing, so she went on to receive a total hip arthroplasty. So advantages of this technique, basically it allows us to have a database of asymptomatic normals. It allows us to compare our patients to age and sex match controls to really quantify the deformity and figure out exactly how much correction you need in the different quadrants. So limitation is definitely the radiation exposure, which we need to work on in the future to create MR techniques. 
But we've also been working with EOS imaging technology, which is a low-dose biplanar radiography, to see how our CT measures could correlate with measures we can get from EOS and cut out that CT scan pre-op. Another application would be to intraop navigation with this aero technology, where we can figure out exactly where to put our acetabular fragment once we can quantify how much deficiency is in which sectors. Thank you so much for your attention.